daily dose of honest science. Hello and welcome back to Daily Dose of Honest Science, your science show that covers medical science. And today I wanted to say uh, thank you for watching and it's season two. It's so cool. <laughs> So we have the first episode of season two right now. And um, I'm really sorry that I was not able to, you know, uh, upload a bit more frequently, but um, I had to do a lot of things and I don't want to dive into it. Um, so thanks for tuning in again. And um, today it's uh, really cool because we have a journal club. So for the people out there, what means journal club? We took actually um, a paper that um, our fields are crossing and um, discuss about it and uh, excite you about the new findings. And uh, a really warm welcome again <laughs> to Dr. Corinna Haupt. Uh, Maybe for the listeners who were not there last time, uh, Corinna, just quickly, who you are? Okay, well, thanks first of all for inviting me to do this journal club with you. This is uh, very exciting. Um, and uh, for the ones that didn't listen to our uh, episode uh, last year, um, my name is Corinna Haupt, as Chantney already said, and I'm a neuroscientist. Um, I um, have worked during my career so far when I was uh, generating my work for my PhD with uh, animal models for stroke. Um, I have uh, done research in the development of the peripheral nervous system. And uh, for the last couple of years, I have been focusing on traumatic brain injuries. So uh, yes, for those who don't know what neuroscientists are doing, we are working on the nervous system and uh, depending on the research area, you either do that with animals or with human beings. Correct. And um, the paper that we are looking at, um, as I said, is crossing both our fields. So for people who joined just, uh, I'm a biochemist, molecular biologist, but uh, specialized in proteomics. So um, I'm actually analyzing proteins in our cells with this, this very fancy mass spec technique. And um, today the um, paper that we want to discuss is um, now the very, you know, scientific uh, title comes. Uh, Cerebrospinal uh, fluid proteomics in patients with Alzheimer's disease reveals five molecular subtypes with distinct genetic risk profiles, um, which was um, actually published this year, beginning of this year, uh, in Nature Aging. So... What you're gonna now get from this uh, whole episode, because you always want to know, right? So what you can expect is um, like, how is the scientific pa paper created? So how do we do that actually? Then um, what does a scientific paper contains, right? So what's the structure? Then um, what is the study about and why should we care? Uh, the method that is used very shortly. And of course that you take a take home message and um, about the study, about the quality of the study, and maybe also what are the limitations of the study. And um, we might uh, answer the questions, can we now detect Alzheimer's disease more efficiently and treat it with personalized medicine? Let's see. And um, very importantly, I will still um, put every uh, paper that uh, we both read uh, put um, in the description box so you can look them up and uh, make your own opinion on this. And now I come to a really big disclaimer to you. We both are not medical professionals. We cannot do any diagnosis, right? And uh, we do not provide any advice for any diagnosis or um, know how to treat patients, very importantly. So we talk about this and these are human samples that people analyzed, so, but we are not in any in that direction. And very importantly, we cannot cover all scientific papers that are out there about this disease. Because when I looked it up already for 2023, there were 17,000 papers only with Alzheimer's disease. And for that time period, no, we cannot do it. So um, just keep in mind. Okay, so Dear Corinna, what is Alzheimer? 
Okay, well, Alzheimer's disease, I guess many people have heard about that. Uh, and you might even know a person uh, who is uh, uh, suffering from that disease. Alzheimer's is a, a neurodegenerative disorder. And it's the most common type of dementia. What does that mean? Neurode neurodegeneration means that uh, over the time there is cells, mainly nerve cells in your brain dying and they are not being replaced. I mean, some organs have the potential to replace cells that are dying. Liberal in the brain, cancer. this is quite yeah. limited. Mm. And uh, due to the amount of cells that are dying over time, um, it's not possible to replace them. And in the end, uh, you can see that, that the brain of the patients that suffer from Alzheimer's uh, is a lot smaller compared to age-matched people who don't suffer from that. So you can say that over the time your brain shrinks and functionally that means that your brain doesn't function as well mm. anymore, right? And that this is what you see in people suffering from dementia, that they have problems to uh, retrieve memories, to make new memories. Sometimes they don't even remember who they are or they don't even understand sentences anymore and give you answers that don't have anything to do with the question you have asked. Yeah, truly. And um, what do you think are the early signs of uh, Alzheimer's disease? So um, is it like something that I would notice right away? Um, I think what one knows at the moment is that very early before people even re yeah, realize that there might be something wrong with them, one knows now from research that um, the connections between the cells that we have in our brain, the neurons, they are connecting via cell contacts. And uh, this is the way that they communicate with each other. And one knows that quite early in Alzheimer's, uh, you see that the communication and the connection is impaired, specifically the plasticity. Plasticity means that these connections can change, they can get stronger or less strong. and. Uh, the plasticity is thought to be the cellular uh, correlate of what we know what's uh, learning and memory, mm -hmm. right? So when we learn something and we memorize something, that is what's going on in the cell, that the communication structures are either strengthened or if we forget things, one has the uh, idea that then this connection is getting less strong. Mm. And uh, this formation of stronger connection seems to be impaired very early in the patients. Mm -hmm. um, so the problem with this disease is it's a very complex disease. So very heterogeneous, right? Um, and the Alzheimer's studies that I've seen and also like many people working on, it's like um, a platter of different pathways that you can, you know, uh, investigate. So, um, of course, um, since there's not one underlying cause, there are two major hallmarks, I would say, from the pathologies. So the beta amyloid plaques that we know, right, that people say, oh, you got plaques, right? Mm -hmm. And then, okay, um, the neurofibrillary tanks, uh, tangles sorry, um, of hyperphosphorylated tau. Yes, I didn't want to go too much in the molecular detail, but um, these two are the, I would say, in the Alzheimer's disease, the most two markers, I guess, um, where someone would say this is now. And the historically oldest markers, yes. right? So mm -hmm. uh, already um, Alois Alzheimer's, who, who, who discovered yes. the disease, yeah. uh, when he was taking samples from his uh, first uh, patient who died, um, then he saw that there's something strange and something different, and and he saw these uh, formations of these plaques. Mm -hmm. So this is this is an, an, an hallmark, and for a very very long time, that was the only way how one could diagnose that someone had died from Alzheimer's disease because you only see it in tissue samples. Mm -hmm. So post mortem analysis. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what are maybe something else that you can do? So did we develop further and not doing only post-mortem stuff? So uh, what do you say? So 
Well, from what I have read, and as you said, we are not medical people. So what uh, I have read, and if I talk to, to colleagues uh, who are medical doctors, so today uh, it's very common to use um, imaging techniques already uh, in the living patients. So besides the uh, psychological testing that one does, where you like have this uh, sheet of paper with a lot of different questions, where you ask uh, the patients uh, whether they remember what they had for breakfast, uh, whether they know what uh, day of the year we have and so on. So besides these psychological tests and sometimes they have to, to draw something and so on, you have the imaging uh, possibilities uh, lately with a so-called PET-CT scan. Uh, this is a positron emission tomography and uh, you have to use a tracer, but one they de did develop a tracer that makes it possible to see these plugs mm -hmm. already in a living patient. So mm -hmm. a couple of years ago, mm -hmm. that was not possible. So you could only see the plugs post-mortem as we have already discussed, right? Mm, true. Um, I will also um, put here some pictures uh, all the time so you can see what we are talking about, right? Um, but this was kind of like very interesting that you can trace it now. But what was the problem with the trace, I think? Um, um, what I have read on, on, on a couple of uh, internet pages also from uh, uh, clinics that offer this method um, that uh, it's, it's a, 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 the tracer is uh, radioactively labeled and it's a very instable label. So um, you have to, or, or they, they do not offer it on an on a everyday basis. So they kind of like have their so special days. So they need an indication that you need the scan. Yes, mm -hmm. first of all that they only uh, investigate patients where they really uh, are quite sure that it is uh, necessary to do that because it's also expensive, but also because the substance is not very stable. Uh, they don't have it in their shelf for everyday use, right? They yeah, order it true. for just its specific mm -hmm. investigation. <coughs> Another um, thing during the research that I did um, was something that might be, maybe you also already got uh, to know is the so-called gut-brain access, right? Um, so there is another field coming up where people think that the microbiome, so the bacteria inside your um, gut, um, actually is really important for the overall health of your um, brain. And we don't want to deep dive because this is a complete other episode, to be honest. But I just wanted to point out that there are so many nuances that you can uh, look at. And um, what I found strikingly is biochemical. There are no really good biochemical assays to really say that patient has no Alzheimer's disease. Yeah, besides uh, seeing the tangles uh, yes. or, or detecting a, a high load of uh, beta amyloid or yes. something like that. Yes. So um, what is so cool about this paper is that they actually took the brain fluid, which is called cerebrospinal fluid, right? Um, so and this is something that I would say it's easy to get, of course, in quotations. Um, but this is something that um, you have and you can learn a lot from it because you said to me once um, that this actually reflects the brain health at that stage, right? Yes, uh, that's the, the really interesting, about, uh, interesting part about this fluid. Um, it's uh, like the, the plasma of our blood, which, uh, I mean, a blood sample, I'm pretty sure everyone <laughs> has been taking a blood sample for whatever reason. And uh, what uh, medical doctors can uh, learn from our blood is what's going on in the body. So all the organs produce uh, some uh, substances that uh, can be found then in the plasma and they are indicators for how well our liver is doing, our heart is doing and, and so on, the kidneys, whatever. Um, since there is a specific border between the blood and the brain, the so-called blood-brain barrier, um, normally you don't find so many indications for how our brain is doing in the blood. We do see some, but it's, it's not uh, as clear as for other organs. But uh, as you said, this cerebrospinal fluid, which is uh, kind of like bathing <laughs> the, the brain and the spinal cord, um, this can be taken and this is telling us uh, what is going on in the brain. Really cool. So um, 
I'm always fascinated by this. So, uh, but um, we go step uh, one step back because um, first of all, maybe the listeners want to know like how is actually a scientific paper made, right? So, um, we could target you all with everything that we have written down here and tell you how amazing this paper is. But in the end, to understand how is actually created is much more um, also much more rewarding to know, right? So. Um, for instance, we both have a hypothesis, right? So in that case, in this paper, um, they discover um, which heterogeneity is in AD patients and can we detect that by differences in the protein composition, right? And uh, if they can do once, um, so can we maybe alter the disease progression maybe? So um, they also wanted to ask, like, um, can we accelerate the uh, AD drug development by studying this? So how does it work? Is? So we have our hypothesis, right? And then we start thinking about designing experiments, how we can show it, what are good controls, um, what maybe someone else has to do, like um, you cannot do every uh, experiment because you're not an expert in every experiment setup, so you will not be able to make proteomics, right? No, I would ask you then. Right, so it's a collaboration, which you see here. That's why so many authors are on the list. Okay. And um, so then, of course, um, we sit down and evaluate our experiments and the results that came out. And then we try to make a coherent story out of this. And this is the actual writing. Don't forget that you need the ethical committee to agree always. Uh, it, ah, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't uh, make a difference whether you're doing experiments with animals. Mm -hmm. And it's even more important if you take samples from uh, patients. So ah. you always need this ethical vote. I guess that's also something important uh, for people to know who don't work in science mm -hmm. that we are not allowed to do just anything. We need permission. True. And this is... Uh, kind of like uh, checked by uh, experts from different fields mm -hmm. and they then agree whether mm -hmm. they mm -hmm. uh, think that the research we want to do mm. is really necessary. Um, thanks for the point because um, for me, since I'm in the uh, basic science, uh, I just express my protein, right? And then I don't need to ask someone. Um, but uh, you're right. So in your case, when you work with mouse models and so on, you always have to have these uh, ethic declarations, right? Yes, true. This is also very important. And then we sit down, write our um, text, so our um, scientific um, research. And um, then we send it out to a journal where we want to publish it. And they um, send it out to other experts from that field and they look at it and then they tell you, well, that's a really cool story. You can publish it. Or oftentimes, unfortunately, you have to do further experiments <laughs> uh, to prove that you are right. And, <laughs> and if it's not experiments, sometimes they want a little more thorough explanation, maybe at some points one wasn't very clear yes. in explaining what one did or what the conclusions are or maybe in their opinion the um, the drawings or the the uh, photographs one mm. took from tissue samples or so are not explaining enough so uh, this uh, committee called the reviewers they are sometimes very strict but i think it's good that's good because we actually check each other's work right um, and when we get a final go from the editor of the journal, um, it's going to be published uh, in, a, in the journal itself. So some big journals still do hard copies, I guess, right? And most of the time online. And that's how I find this one. So it just came out, right? And um, now we go back to the study. So this study looked at um, the cerebral spinal fluid and how this might be different in AD patients compared to controls. So cerebral spinal fluid, um, Corinna, I don't know really, I cannot grasp it. I just, you know, it's like brain fluid. Can you maybe a bit elaborate on um, what that is actually so like um is it colorless is it you know yes uh, so i guess a blood sample everyone has seen um you know that the color is red um the color of the cerebral spinal fluid is uh, colorless so it's a rather clear fluid and under normal conditions it should not contain any cells so in blood we have many cells um and um 
what can one say? It's uh, about the amount. One knows that we have several liters of blood. <laughs> the cerebral uh, spinal fluid is not that much. We have about 150 milliliters per person in an adult. Um, we uh, exchange the volume about four to five times a day, which is a lot, and it's an uh, an ultra filtrate of the blood, so to speak. So, um, and uh, you then find specific proteins from the grain because it's secreted and it's exchanged with the cerebrospinal fluid, and um, the biggest content is water. Um, there are also some uh, ions and some vitamins. Uh, you can find a little bit of DNA and RNA in there. Um, now, one can ask, why do we need that? Mm -hmm. I mean, if yeah. you already have blood, so why does the brain need something? Yeah, why do something? we need an extra fluid, right? So exactly. What might be the function, actually, of this fluid? So, um, if you just imagine, I don't know if anyone has seen brain tissue, but brain tissue, if it's not encapsulated, mm -hmm by our skull, brain tissue is very, very soft. And um, even softer than any other tissue we have in the body. So if one would want to imagine, one takes out the brain and puts it on the table, it doesn't take very long and it will be flat as a pancake. So um, it's a very delicate tissue. And um, if we like bump our head, and we wouldn't have the liquid that is surrounding our brain, brain damage would be quite tough. And one knows that we do have damage to the brain if we really hit our head very hard. But this uh, would already happen if you if you just, just bump your head because you didn't uh, hit the entrance to your <laughs> house or something <laughs> like that. So. Um, so it's it's a, like a cushion or a shock absorber, so mm -hmm. to speak. And it's thereby it's surrounding the brain and uh, the spinal cord. And uh, you also, due to the development of the brain, you also find it in some cavities of the brain. And in these cavities of the brain, it's uh, that have a connection to the outside. Um, there you find also the structures. These are specific cells that produce this ultra filtrate. And um, uh, yeah, that's um, about that's what I think is most important to know. Yeah, and uh, I'm fascinated. I'm learning so much about my brain right now. So um, it's really cool. And um, so one thing, of course, is like um, the CFS can also like CSF can also be like, um, uh, as we said before, as an indicator for the brain health, right? Um, and um, what could be really cool, and this is what the study did, um, if it's indicator for our health, so maybe we find something as a biomarker also um, to or diagnostic um, alterations that we find to detect Alzheimer much more earlier, right? And um, then um, when we now know what uh, CSF does, um, do you know how it's collected? Yes, it's a little more complicated than getting a blood sample. Um, so uh, you can imagine uh, it's not so easy to stab your skull. <laughs> One doesn't do that. So the collection is done um, at the uh, vertebrae, located quite lumbar, so meaning closer to your behind. Mm -hmm. um, why does one collect it there? And one really has to puncture and take a very fine needle and enter the cavity um, of the vertebral column. One does go very lumber, so very low, because at this level, we don't really have the spinal cord anymore. Um, the spinal cord ends just before the lumbar area. And in this part, we only have the nerves that derive from the spinal cord and then leave the vertebral column at a later stage. But um, the opportunity we have there is due to the structure of these nerves and not this compact structure that uh, the spinal cord has. Once you puncture that, and I mean, one doesn't really go through, <laughs> just in. Um, but 
in the case you do hit one of these nerves, since they are bathing in our cerebrospinal fluid, you kind of like push them aside. And so the, the chances of really doing damage is very, very low. Mm -hmm. Of course, it's not without pain or anything. Yes, yeah. So one does have to use uh, some uh, local um, anesthetical anesthetical yeah. exactly um, and uh, it's probably not a pleasant experience no. I can I can tell that from people telling mm -hmm. me I have not experienced it myself um, but um, it's still a very important way to get this important diagnostic uh, potential fluid yeah. So to speak. And uh, not only for that uh, sp specific um, paper that we are talking about, in general, sometimes it's really important to check this fluid because um, some bacteria um, might have entered the brain, right? And then you need to know maybe some uh, what is going on. Is the infection already really far? So um, in other diagnostics, people are already using CSF. Yes. So it's not like something that is new or something. No, it's right? not a new invention. One no. does use that for certain investigations of uh, certain diseases. Uh, so it's it's not an uncommon method. It's, yes. a, it's a quite old method, so to say. Yes. Okay, so we explained kind of a lot of things. Um, so now we're going to go deep dive into this uh, really cool paper. Um, I just want to give really briefly like uh, what is in a nutshell and then we go much more deeper. So um, this study looked at the um, protein differences in the um, CSF of uh, AD patients mm -hmm. and um, they identified so-called five molecular subtypes. So and these sub subtypes are um, correlated to subtype 1, for instance, hyperplasticity. Then subtype 2 uh, has to do with innate immune activation. Subtype um, 5 would be blood-brain barrier dysfunction. Subtype 4 is choroid um, or choroid um, plexus dysfunction. And subtype 3 was um, with RNA dysregulation. So we're going to explain a bit more in, in a minute. Um, and the cool thing is that um, they did not only look at the molecular pathways, they also correlated it to the genetic risk variants of Alzheimer's. So um, we know from research that unfortunately there is a higher risk if you have certain gene mutations, unfortunately, and APOE4 is one of them. Um, and they looked at the clinical characteristics, so the atrophy of the brain actually, and correlated that to the each subtype. And that is a really nice um, information because not every subtype was um, equally responding to that. Genau. Um, I just want to go quickly on the method and then we deep dive into subtype mm -hmm. one and two. Maybe one could at this point also mm -hmm. point out that um, they were making use of a large uh, bio uh, tissue and sample bank in the Netherlands. Yeah. So it's not that they uh, went out hunting for patients no. for their study. True. I mean, people might not yeah, know might, that. Yeah, might right? be thinking like, give me your CSF. <laughs> and uh, so th that's um, maybe a, a very important point, again, how the scientific community is working together, that they came up with, well, once we collect samples from patients to, to like, investigate their disease, uh, we can ask patients to donate parts of their samples to such a biobank. And then uh, whenever there is need for uh, other research questions, one can uh, make use of these samples that have already been collected. So and they're cryopreserved, they I guess, right? Yes, exactly. So there's different samples. I mean, people take samples from all kinds of body fluids and tissue yeah. samples for yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. And in this case, they t uh, took advantage of the CSF samples that had already been collected from patients mm -hmm. and also from people uh, not suffering from Alzheimer's disease because you always need a control. I mm. think we have not pointed this out. Yeah. Right. So, so of course, people that are not yet diagnosed with it, right? So you never know if a control turns later on to a... <laughs> um, so why um, our two fields crossed, of course, because neurobiology, it makes sense, Alzheimer's disease, but uh, proteomics. So it's the study of the proteins in our cell or in the fluid that we are looking at. So um, in general, how it works. So 
you have to imagine you have your um, CSF that is clear and then you want to know what kind of proteins are in there. So what you do, you isolate them. Then um, you chop them off with specific enzymes. Um, kind of like you can imagine um, what is happening inside your stomach actually. So, right, so you digest protein, right? So you just want to gain the muscles that you just hard working. Um, and um, the proteins are chopped off by these proteases and um, you get so-called peptides. So these are the smaller fractions, you could say. And um, the cool thing here is they labeled them. So this is an additional step. And um, in proteomics, we always have the problem that um, since our instruments, uh, they are sensitive, but sometimes prone for quantification problems, paper, people come up with really cool um, applications. And this one is, for instance, one. This is the isobaric labeling um, tandem mass tag called. Not much of interest here, but just that you know how the method is called. And what happens is that this specific um, compound that they use is heavily labeled with a heavy carbon and with a heavy nitrogen. And when we um, label there our proteins or the peptides in that case, um, we can actually see that in our instrument. And then we know, ah, okay, this peptide that we identified, we can even quantify. And that is really cool because then we know how much of the later protein is actually in there. Is it down or upregulated? So oh, that's the base for being able to compare Completely. between patients. And yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, that's basically it. And then, of course, you have the large data that you created and you needed to uh, analyze the data, of course, which is sometimes a bit difficult because sometimes so many proteins. So, um, but this is how basically this whole uh, method works. And we have to end our first part here. We talked about Alzheimer's disease and its molecular characteristics. We talked about what kind of techniques do we have to visualize it in patients. And we talked about how cool your brain fluid is, so the called CSF, and actually determines the health of your brain. The next part of the episode will be about the subtypes specifically already mentioned here in the first part. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, as always, remember, let a little dose of honest science in your life and brighten up your day.